Is there really no evidence for God's existence? I think in a world in which um, people are most persuaded by scientific quote unquote claims, right? I mean, science is the arbiter of all truth in the culture we're living today. And I hear this all the time. Well, you cannot prove God's existence with evidence. It's really, is that true? Is there no evidence for the existence of God? Well, I learned one thing working criminal trials. There's only two forms of evidence, right? There's direct evidence and indirect evidence. That's it. That's every form of evidence that we use when making a case in front of a jury. Direct and indirect evidence. Now, direct evidence is of one kind. It is eyewitness testimony. If it's not an eyewitness who can tell you what happened, who did it, it can describe the entire event for you, then you can't use direct evidence. Now, indirect evidence is everything else. And in cases like mine, DNA evidence, that's indirect. Fingerprints, indirect evidence. Behaviors people observed, indirect evidence. Statements he made, indirect evidence. Unless it's an eyewitness who can tell you what happened, everything else is indirect evidence. But by the way, there's no such category as hard evidence, so please stop saying that. We don't have hard evidence and soft evidence. There's direct evidence and indirect evidence. Now, could we make a case for God's existence from direct and indirect evidence? I think you could. Direct evidence might include, for example, eyewitness accounts, even if they're written down over a period of time. We have four gospels that provide us with direct evidence, eyewitness accounts, and we can test those. But that's one way to determine, if, by the way, if there's a person historically who rose from the grave with the power of God, and you have an eyewitness account that chronicles that, and if you test the eyewitness account and it passes all the flying colors, why would you not consider that to be sufficient evidence to believe that God exists? But if that's not the way you want to go, and you want to go with indirect evidence, well, if we were in a universe all where all space, time, and matter leapt into existence from nothing, that universe that resulted appears to be fine-tuned to a razor's edge for the existence of life. Not only that, life emerges from non-life in a way that is still yet, no one can explain that even now. There are origin of life studies that still cannot explain how life emerges from non-life. And when it does emerge, it has a very commonly held uh, observation that biology displays at least the signs of design, the attributes of the appearance of design. But also we're in a universe in which we have minds that act freely we are in a universe that has objective, transcendent moral truths. We are in a universe in which we sense the presence of evil or the existence of evil. And we have to have some type of, of high moral standard of righteousness to even detect such a thing. Look, these are indirect attributes of the universe that we could make a case. We could use these as evidence to make a case for the existence of God. Because it turns out that if there is a God, he is the best explanation for those attributes of the universe. And that's all we're trying to do in a crime scene, right? Is figure out which suspect will best explain the evidence in our crime scene. It turns out that you can make a case for God from both the direct and indirect evidence. But let me give you another way of thinking about this. What kind of evidence would even suffice? What are we really looking for here? I always ask that question because if what they want and what they need is for God to come right now and, and act miraculously in this moment and write their name in the stars or write their name on the side of the mountain, well, I can't make that happen for you. So I don't think we can have a productive conversation if that's the kind of evidence you need. But I think we could look at attributes of the universe and ask specific questions and see if the best inference is not a what as a cause, but a who. So for example, as I look at the information in DNA, and I see how those nucleotides are arranged in that longest molecule known to humans, DNA, and I see that that information, those nucleotides are arranged in a code that is informative, that is information. And I realize from all my past experiences anywhere, that information always comes from the mind of an intelligent being, why would I not then look for a who to explain the information in DNA? Let me put it to you this way. If I walked into a crime scene and there was a struggle in this crime scene and the, su the suspect killed the victim here, and sure enough, there is blood spatter on the wall where the murder occurred. That spatter pattern, I can attribute to the physics of blood and gravity and action that caused the blood spatter on the wall. I could explain that with nothing more than physics. But if I walked into the same room, and instead of there being blood spatter on the wall, there was written in this victim's blood, he deserved it on the wall. Now I'm not looking for a what 
It's not physics that caused that. I'm looking for a who, because that information and that sequence of code we call language, right? The, the English language, if it's written in English, that has to come not from physics, but from a mind. If we are seeing information in DNA, and we know by practical experience, it always comes from mind, why would we not look for a who in explaining DNA? By the way, a very famous atheist named Antony Flew, one of the most famous atheists of the last century, before he died, moved from atheism to at least deism or theism, on the basis of one thing, information in DNA. Even Antony Flew decided at some point it was not reasonable to answer that, to look for a cause that was a what. He knew the only cause that could cause information in DNA was a who. So yes, you actually can use the world around us and evidence in the world around us to infer that the most reasonable explanation for that evidence is the existence of God. Is believing in God like believing in the flying spaghetti monster? When I hear skeptics online mock or poke fun at believers, Christians, or any kind of theist, you'll often hear them say that believing in God is like believing in the flying spaghetti monster. This flying spaghetti monster as a notion uh, has been offered as kind of a substitute for God. And it was first really created by a guy named Bobby Henderson in 2005. He also created a kind of a larger view called Pastafarianism. And really this was created by Bobby in response to the Kansas school district where he saw that intelligent design, a notion of creation that comes from the mind of a designer to explain the features of the, of the cosmos, the features of biology. He saw that emerging in his local school district and he decided to offer this alternative and to claim that believing in God is as ridiculous as believing in the flying spaghetti monster. But let's be clear about one thing. Bobby does not believe in the flying spaghetti monster any more than he believes in God. This was really just a notion that was invented to kind of make the distinction, to make a case against God. And although he's applied in a number of countries for Pastafarianism as a recognized national religion, he's been denied everywhere he applied. Why? Why would that be the case? Well, in large part, because people understand and governments understand and nations understand the difference between religious claims and fictional claims. We have good evidence to demonstrate that Christianity is true from both the direct evidence of eyewitness accounts and the indirect evidence of features of the universe that demonstrate that God exists. It's not as though we're just picking a notion out of thin air and, and describing it in such a way that we want everyone to believe. But no way, actually, this is the great thing about Christianity. Christianity is not just a claim unattached, an unattached claim, a set of proposals about God. No, Christianity is a claim about a historical event that can be tested the way that other historical events can be tested. Look, I will tell you that there are certain kind of fortune cookie type of religious claims, maybe a set of just proverbs that people will look at and say, these are the beautiful teachings of Buddha or Baha'u'llah, but these do not describe an event that's rooted in history, like the resurrection. That is the claim of Christianity. It makes Christianity very different than any other kind of religious claim. It's not as though people thought up, well, let's just think of a crazy character like the flying spaghetti monster. No, it's that something happened in the course of history that people observed and wrote about. And we have that direct evidence claim to review thousands of years later. That is very different. Can you see the difference between fictional notions that are not rooted in history and claims for which we have an historical record? If we can't see that distinction, it's gonna be hard to advance any conversation about the nature of God or Christianity. The claims related to the flying spaghetti monster are by their very nature very different than the claims related to Christianity.